Hi. Hi. Good afternoon. So whoever is staying, please have a seat. Uh, the rest I would uh, kindly ask uh, to leave the room. So um, I'm very happy to be chairing today's uh, last session. I'm also very excited to see something that it is slowly disappearing, that it is like an all male panel. So uh, I think that it is one of the very few male panel and hopefully they are disappearing as, as I said. So anyway, that does not mean that uh, what we're going to hear today is very interesting. Uh, we're going to be hearing about uh, digital assets and what happens with, with our um, digital remains once we pass away and also about the, the privacy paradox and how this applies to this case. Then we are going to explore um, group privacy and we're going to go very deep into philosophical discussions on whether there is group rights and whether we should uh, protect that. Um, also taking into account um, Luciano's Floridi's reasoning, etc. And then uh, last but not least, we are going to have a quite technical uh, presentation that are going to look at data protection impact assessment. And we're going to see actually a tool that it is looking at uh, verification of um, of uh, an analysis of um, yeah of, of privacy properties. So uh, with all that, let me introduce you to our first speaker. Um, the first paper it is uh, coming from Tel Aviv University uh, from Professor Michael Birnak and Tal Morse. Um, Michael is an associate dean for research at uh, Tel Aviv University and also professor of law. He directs the Parasol International uh, LLM program and the Horowitz Institute for IP. And among his interests are school surveillance and also digital remains. So let's work him with an applause. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eduardo. So, uh, no, it's okay. Uh, we'll wait for that until the end and then uh, see if we, if we are worthy of that. Uh, so I apologize for the grim topic, but it's becoming part of life because people, uh, as we go online, we accumulate information and data, and eventually all of us, I'm sorry to say, will die. And the question is, what happens with uh, our personal data once we, uh, once we die? So uh, in this study, we uh, frame the issue of digital remains or digital memories sometimes, but we don't like it, also referred to as digital assets, uh, within the well-known framework or the idea or the notion of the privacy paradox with all its problems. I will come to that later. We do so uh, by, uh, uh, we have conducted an empirical study uh, which I would like to present uh, the findings and discuss some of the uh, implications. So uh, the idea of the privacy paradox is well familiar within uh, privacy circles. No, it's not the best term ever. Uh, it's not exactly a paradox, it's more of a conflict or discrepancy, etc. But when I say privacy paradox, everybody knows what we refer to. The gap between users, data subjects, uh, wishes uh, about their privacy and what it seems that they are actually doing, that gap over there. In the privacy paradox literature, uh, we have a few explanations for why this paradox exists. One of them is there is no paradox. People don't want privacy as much as they say. They say they want more. Actually, they want a bit less. They trade off their privacy for whatever so-called free services they receive. Another stronger explanation is uh, information deficiencies. People do not understand about the collection of data. And another explanation are various cognitive biases uh, that apply in this uh, uh, situations. Uh, users also distinguish between the social realm and the institutional, uh, the institutional one. So users care a lot what their friends think and know about them, but less what Facebook, Google, etc. Uh, know or collect data uh, about them. We ask what happens to this paradox when we go to the posthumous 
uh, condition. In other words, do people's, do users' wishes about their personal data after they die, will, do they behave in a way that will fulfill those matches? Is there a gap between uh, those uh, wishes and interests and uh, preferences and the actual behavior about the specific uh, situation? So we've conducted an empirical study. We assumed that we will find a variety of approaches among uh, users, low familiarity with uh, online tools such as Google's uh, inactive management account, uh, inactive account management, uh, and Facebook's legacy contact. Uh, we assume that we will find a lot of access by default. I will explain that term. Uh, later, uh, later on, and we assume that we will find some sort of a privacy paradox. We just didn't know what kind of uh, paradox we will find. So we conducted a, a survey, an extensive survey, with Israeli users. Uh, it's a representative sample of the population, and we asked them about their preferences and practices regarding four different services. Uh, email, social networks, cloud storage, and dating websites, which, as you can expect, behave very differently, so we left them outside of the current uh, uh, discussion. So, this is the first finding. Um, email, social networks, cloud. More or less the same, but not quite, slight, slight differences. Uh, about 45% to 50% wish to allow access to all of their content. And uh, they provide explanations. Uh, they want their kids or family or friends to remember them. So it's a matter of memory and commemoration uh, and to leave something behind me, etc. I want them to know me better when they grow up, if it's children, etc. About a third, uh, plus minus, say no way, nothing. When I die, I want my data to die with me. and. 20%, 19% say, well, for some issues, yes, for some items, no. Uh, we uh, collected that together, and uh, these are the uh, results across the different services and the different platforms. So much variety here between users and their uh, wishes uh, for that. What do people actually do? So I've mentioned Google has the inactive account manager, which how many of in this room have heard about it? That's all. Okay. How many have used it of the two? <laughs> One. Okay. Uh, and uh, Facebook has the legacy contact uh, option. Users can appoint someone to be their legacy contact, which means that the legacy contact will be able to do some things with the user's account after the user uh, uh, dies, but not have access, not take over the account. Only have uh, be able to change the photo, etc. Uh, we asked users about familiarity with that. Only 18%, which is more than in this room, only 18% said they have heard about uh, those uh, services. But only 6%, kind of 6% of the entire uh, uh, um, survey, uh, have actually used. So low familiarity and much lower use of those online tools. Then we asked about access by default. Access by default means the following situation. A user dies, but then family members or friends just access their computer and open it. And once they open it, they are logged in. No passwords needed, for example, which is quite prevalent with many of us. Or uh, many users have a list in print or in handwriting of their passwords for themselves because you know, we have so many passwords, etc., and we don't necessarily want the computer to remember it, so people have those lists. So if they, or when they die, someone else might have access to that list, and hence access by default, not necessarily by intention. It can be by intention, but not necessarily so. So these are the results for each of the uh, service, services we examined, and Altogether, uh, as you can see, about a quarter have full access by default in that way to their all their accounts. 29% uh, have no access, will leave no access of this kind, and the rest have partial access depending on uh, the service. So, is there a paradox? Is there a difference between the post mortem access preferences and the access by default? 
Now, these are not necessarily the same guys, okay, in, 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 the bo in both sides. So we um, uh, did a, ma a, a ma matrix of, of some sort, uh, preference on this side and actual behavior over here. So for some groups, there's no paradox. For example, those that wish to share everything and enable full access by default because they don't use passwords or they left a list, a handwritten list of passwords, for them there will be no paradox. Their wish as to the use and access of their data after they die will be fulfilled. Someone will have access because they enabled that and the other way around on the other corner. For some, there will be the paradox. This is the good old paradox that we are familiar with. Uh, for example, in the, in the corner, people who wish their preference is that nobody has access to anything after they die, okay? But in fact, do leave full access by default because they have no password. So whatever family member or friends who will have access to their devices, computer or cell phone, will have access to everything. For them, there's a gap between their wishes, everything deleted after I die, and what is likely to happen when they die. But this is the new, the last, the rest of the table is the more interesting because it's new, uh, in our finding at least, uh, new, new situations. And we call it the inverted paradox. Look at the corner. People who wish to share everything. A user who says, I want my kids, family, spouse, etc., to have full access to my accounts. But their behavior today, when they are alive, is exactly the opposite. They did not use the online tools of Google and Facebook and maybe something else that exists. They uh, do require lots of passwords, okay, and they did not leave any list. In other words, if they die now, uh, nobody will have access to their um, accounts and the family members etc will have to approach Facebook Google etc who are not keen on enabling access they do so only if a court orders them as was the case in Germany uh, last year uh, the group in the middle requires more fine-tuning which we haven't yet done and just to give you an idea uh, yeah you can see the, the the inverted situation is the largest of all okay most people will be, in, in our sample, in that situation where uh, they wish others to have access, but this is unlikely to happen. For the others, it's irregular uh, paradoxes. So the question is, well, there is a posthumous privacy paradox, but in a more nuanced way than the regular one, including the inverted one. And the question is why? So some of the uh, explanations offered earlier for the living users might apply here, information deficiencies, uh, obviously. However, the posthumous condition raises new and additional complexities. People don't want to deal with that. It's an unpleasant thought to think, oh, I'm about to die, or I might die, or I will die, and I have to manage it for the same reasons that uh, many people, not all, but many people avoid writing a will and then the law has to interfere and regulate inheritance in various ways if there is uh, property or, or assets to, to, uh, to leave to, to future generations. So obviously the next question is the regulation and how we should regulate that if at all. Uh, not regulating is of course also a choice that means leaving it for the platforms to make the decision, which is the case in most jurisdictions uh, at this uh, point. Thank you for your attention. Um, so we have right now five minutes for, for questions. So I will um, give the audience the opportunity to raise your hand, uh, approach the mic. I don't know if the, that mic is working. If not, I have also some comments for the author, but is there anyone in the audience that wants to um, make a comment? Yes, please. Yeah, come. I don't know if this works. Does it work? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, please stand up and, and come. Yeah. 
So thank you very much. It was very uh, interesting because this paradox I, I had never reflected on that. And um, uh, so more uh, comment or uh, I mean looking for what I was. Um, what is the regulation in Europe? Maybe we could have something on that because uh, the GDPR says that posthumous, I mean post-mortem privacy is not. Uh, the object of regulation. Member states are free to do something, and uh, there are different uh, different uh, kinds of uh, implementation. So I wanted to ask your opinion. Uh, there is the French or uh, Catalan. I don't know why just Catalan and not the old Spanish system adopted a uh, test. <laughs> Catalonia is not Spain. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it was a weak point for our chair, uh, but <laughs> so no. The point was. Um, uh, they have this uh, like um, uh, posthumous will. They can like testament, so they can uh, decide who is the uh, fiduciary person that will uh, implement uh, and some directions. Other countries just don't regulate it, and there is uh, some particular example like uh, Estonia, in which they say for 20 years we need the consent of the uh, um, successors for doing. I mean, for going on with data processing, we need, and after 20 years, it, you don't need anything more. So maybe it's like uh, close to the copyright or something else that you have an expiry period. So do you think that um, if we have uh, like legislation allowing this post-mortem uh, digital testament, is something that could change this paradox? People get more, or you think that deregulation is something that uh, I mean, and so that we can use more some Google or Facebook um, examples. Thank you. So uh, th thank you for the question, and as for the situation in Europe, you gave a a, a very good overview, right? Uh, the question is, uh, in my view, uh, the normative one, right? What what should we do? What 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 would I advise policymakers approaching us, whether to enact something or law? And as you mentioned, there are laws in uh, France, in Spain that I'm familiar with. I, did, I was unfamiliar with Estonia. Thank you. Uh, and the U.S. Some of the states, most of the states, it's a state level, not a federal issue, have uh, laws regulating various aspects here. The thing is that there are different kinds of digital information here. Some of them might be property. If I have a Bitcoin, that's property and it's worth money and it goes to the heirs, whoever they are, according to a will or inheritance law, etc. Sometimes the, the information is information about property. Maybe when I die, someone will realize that, oh, he had a bank account which had no offline print paper, but only digital. Uh, in other cases, there might be copyright. Every photograph we take is basically subject to copyright, but most users don't think of it as property in the copyright IP sort of sense. And then the most interesting part in this discussion is the regular personal data. Communications, which websites I served, uh, what, what did I, with whom I communicated, what was the content of the communications, my personal files, which I did not share with anyone, that sort of, um, that sort of stuff. It's quite tempting to follow what we know from the offline world, which is wills and inheritance. However, uh, wh which, is, which is a matter of default rules, right? If you, in most countries, if uh, you do not have a will, so there are default rules that say this goes to the child, to the spouse, etc. If, however, uh, a person writes a will and it's a valid a will, and it's a valid will, so, so courts follow the will and, and do that. Here it's more difficult, uh, and that's the importance of one of the slides of the variety of preferences that users have. Um, whatever, and at least in Israel, right? Uh, I assume this, the picture will be quite similar in other places, but uh, whatever default rule will be put in place, it will, at least initially, frustrate the wishes of a substantial group of the population. Now, it might be a transitional issue. Maybe after a year or two years, people will adjust and adjust their behavior and maybe change their preferences. That's also a possibility, right? Because many people ask, oh, what, 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 what does everybody else do? Oh, okay, that's good enough for me, right? So we, we do have that uh, tendency. Uh, so for the time being, my suggestion would be to, le to leave it to the users. Now, leaving it to the users at this point with the low familiarity of the option, 
of the options means practically leaving it to the um, to Facebook and Google to to make the the decision. It works actually. I think it works pretty good. Uh, we do hear once in a while about the unusual case, like the German case, uh, where. Uh, uh, a girl presumably committed suicide, a teenager, and her parents wanted access to a Facebook account because obviously they wanted to understand better what happened. Uh, and they thought that they might find clues uh, over there. Facebook said, forget about it. And the German court in appeal, uh, on appeal said, uh, Facebook, you should allow access. Uh, and, and they used a property uh, uh, paradigm for that. Thank you so much. Um, yes, that is actually what I thought that it was very interesting in your paper that um, the difference, and just to finish this, is that between the offline world and the online world is the role of the platform, right? Yeah. That maybe like in other cases, like um, in the offline world is, is not the, the case. It will be very interesting to see the, the full paper. So thank you so much. Um, now we give uh, room to um, Michele Loy, uh, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of uh, Zurich. Um, and uh, he's presenting a paper also written with Marcus uh, Christen. Um, if CPDP was already interdisciplinary. I think that with Michele we have uh, <laughs> like him de like him. Why? Because he's a political philosopher turned bioethicist, turned a digital ethicist. Uh, maybe we will need some explanation about what was going on there. Uh, and actually now he's working in different projects, including one in the ethical implications of uh, big data. And uh, basically, he's interested in bringing insights from ethics and politics philosophy to the realm of big data. So let's hear what he needs to say. Yes, uh, and if I may add, uh, Marcus Christen is a philosopher too. So neither of us is a law scholar, which is probably a more common background here, or, or a computer scientist. Actually, Marcus is also kind of a, is a neuroinformatician and a philosopher, too. <coughs> so, um, let's see how this works. Um, with a philosophical way of talking about privacy and group privacy. So, first of all, I, I really like to uh, explain that the point of this paper is just to tidy up the conceptual space. There is no kind of agenda behind or big idea. It's, uh, it's, it's really a paper of conceptual analysis. So I try to be as clear as possible about the concepts. We distinguish two concepts of group privacy, and both of them are species of privacy conceived in this way, as a condition of restricted access to the self or information about the self. So if you consider like two main ways of think about privacy in terms of access or control, uh, we definitely take the access uh, way, not the control way. Now, uh, uh, of the two authors, I am the one more uh, with more definite ideas about this than Marcus. I don't know if he has a strong view about that. <coughs> but I kind of find this way much more plausible. So for instance, being left alone is a condition of restricted access to the self. Now it's important to distinguish, of course, the condition of privacy from the right to privacy. So having privacy is not the same thing as having a right to privacy. So the right to be left alone is a right to privacy defined in terms of access. Of course, the two things, to, to my mind, are quite different. So a condition is like being nourished, and the right to a condition is like the right to be nourished which doesn't imply, if you have the right, that you have to be nourished. You may choose to actually fast. And of course, control enters the picture somehow, because having a right, if you have a right to privacy, then we can unpack this right in terms of the Hofeldian incidents, and you not only have a claimed right to privacy, which implies and is implied by other people's duty not to invade your privacy, but I would say you also have a power right to privacy, which gives you the liberty to annul other people's uh, uh, duty which derives from your claim right. Basically, you can say people, you may invade my privacy, just like you know, with, your, with your home. You can say to people, you may enter your home. 
Why is privacy important? For a lot of reasons. I actually think that, not that both are important, and probably also for different reasons. So both privacy, the condition, and the right to privacy are important. <coughs> and are, I believe also they're important both intrinsically. Like some people have a preference for privacy as such. Being left alone is valuable as such some degree in certain to a certain measure and also as a means to other things like avoiding discrimination this is kind of the, the conceptual framework behind now to the question can groups have privacy i think the question is yes we think the question is is yes even if we don't have a strong view it's more like we we feel safe about conceding this this point in general and the idea is not that new Blaustein talks about it in a, in a book which is actually older than, than this uh, uh, version, I think. And uh, there are many cases. Lovers need group privacy, patient, physician, confessor, priest, journalist, source, private organizations, and they need it also for different reasons, uh, we could say. It's also called confidentiality very often. Now, that's a question. Should individuals or groups have a right to this group privacy, and why? And I think there are several good reasons why they should have it. Blaustein talks about the desire need of people to come together and exchange information, share feelings, make plans, and act in concert to attain their objectives. So it, it, it has to be broader than the individual, but it cannot reach everybody because group privacy protects other people's outer space. So their gregarious nature. It's not a desire to uh, complete seclusion. Or Floridi, who talks about entering into a new supra-agent, which, which, which needs some protection from outside. This is the old-fashioned group privacy and there is some tendency in the literature uh, when, when citing Blostein to say, well, but that's, that's only the individual and the sum of individual <laughs> privacy. It's probably as one reason for it is that Blaustein thinks how, how to conceive to the right to group privacy as an individual right. That's what he says. But sometimes you have a thing to read beyond what an author says because it doesn't really think so much about that question. So they, they, they usually in these papers by Floridi, Montelero, and Pagalo are contained in this, uh, in this uh, edited book about group privacy. There is a tendency to say, okay, but that's the old stuff, and that's, the, that's merely the sum of individual privacy. I don't think so. We don't think so. Conceptually, group's privacy is not the sum of individual privacy. And uh, also, the, from the, the right to group privacy we can have a group right to group privacy. So we can have an individual right to group privacy, which is already different from the sum of individual privacy. We can have a group right to group privacy, which can be justified both in terms of the interest of right and in terms of the will theory of rights. In our paper, we distinguish two different versions of this traditional group privacy, which we call what happens in Vegas stay in Vegas privacy, both of them. There are two variants. One we call seclusive, and the other one antagonistic. Seclusive group privacy basically is privacy of the group against every, everyone else. While antagonistic uh, group privacy is privacy of the group against a particular other group, while other people are not so important. So if you prefer the picture, I hope that the picture... Can you go one slide back for one second? Pardon? Okay, but you find this in the paper. Okay, it's not, not published, it's still under review, so we don't know if it will ever be in a paper. But I have it here. So. <laughs> but look at the picture. So in what we call seclusive uh, privacy, the group shares information within the group and other people are completely excluded. That's, if you think about the sect, like the masonry secret group, they, that, that's what they, they, they need and they want. Uh, or even an organization can need that. Antagonistic group privacy think that's more the situation. You go with a group of friends to Las Vegas, certain things happen in Las Vegas, you don't want these things to reach back home, but you're quite indifferent if other people in Las Vegas see you. 
not all of Las Vegas privacy is like that. So we use the, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas for this idea of privacy. And then we also think it's quite plausible to justify a group right to privacy where according to the interest of your right, a right to group privacy must be a group right if and only if it promotes a group interest which of course cannot be decomposed into individual interest which uh, we think it's pl quite plausibly the case if you think about the privacy of, of organization. It's, it's not, it's not the, 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 the it, five minutes, right? Okay. So if you doubt about it, ask yourself this question. If Russian hackers violate the confidentiality of Hillary Clinton's email, whose interest is it that it is violated? Is it just Hillary Clinton's email? Maybe not. And also from the point of view of the weird theory of rights, it seems possible that uh, groups uh, can exercise uh, their, their group privacy. This can be a corporate right, as probably legal theories are more <laughs> aware even of these concepts, like exercised by the representative. It can even be a group chat that is organized democratically and, and, the, and, the, and the group decides together who should be admitted in and out. So let's take stock. There is such a thing as group privacy and it makes sense to have group rights to it. Now, with the debate about big data, there's a shift in attention to these groups which are created by profiling uh, based on data sets and they, they're not ideas, uh, of, they're not what we normally think about as a group. They are not self-constituted. They are grouped by, people are grouped by the algorithms. Uh, Florida thinks, thinks about the owners of such and such kind of car, shoppers, uh, uh, lovers of a certain kind of music, and so on. Are these groups, in the paper we distinguish two kinds of groups, A groups and B groups, where A groups we can say are the traditional groups, groups that have an interaction history, collective goals, or at least awareness of themselves as a group with which they identify. Well, B groups are these new kind of groups that may have no awareness of, all of themselves as groups. So this is the new uh, allegedly interesting debate on group privacy. And we also define this concept of inferential group privacy, which has to do with the fact that you don't want uh, to be sorted as being part of the group because of some feature or vector of feature, which is typically what to do with an algorithm. So you may discover, for instance, that you, uh, there's an inference about N people that all people who like a certain kind of music are something else. So the group is the people who like some sort of music, or maybe much more complicated one. People who like some sort of music and listen to it at night between uh, midnight and four, and, and, and four, and four o'clock. So basically, our thesis in the paper is that if you combine the, the two kinds of groups and the two kinds of privacy, and you, and you consider the arguments, the most intuitively compelling examples of group privacy are actually examples of A groups, groups with some sort of interaction or self-definition uh, that, that care about or there are reasons to value the, what happens in Vegas, say in Vegas privacy. But the new debate about big data is about inferential privacy related to these big groups, these less structured groups. And th so we argue that a right to inferential group privacy for big groups is, first of all, unfeasible. And even if it is uh, feasible, there will be significant moral arguments against it. And some of these, I, I will not list all of them here, maybe it's better to discuss them, to have in, in, in the discussion, but some of them have to do with the fact that uh, preventing uh, others from making inference uh, about you, it can be very costly in terms of other values that we uh, as a society also want to, 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 to promote. Basically because every time we produce generalizable knowledge knowledge su for such a, for example, that, that, that smoke causes cancer, this reduces the inferential privacy of a group, in this case of the group of smokers. These people suddenly are, can, can, can become, we, uh, we can know about them, for instance, that they have a higher risk of dying earlier than other people. So I will say if you want to discuss more about that, and thank you for your attention, I hope you.
Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Jose Ramirez. I'm from Chile. Just about to, to ring. Um, yeah, any questions? Very good. Please, Silvia first, and then Aviva. Hi, thanks. Silvia de Conca from Tilt, actually, colleague of Lynette uh, Taylor and the others. Um, especially from your last slide, one of the smokers, mm -hmm. um, I'd like to ask you your opinion about something that is going on in my mind. Um, does this mean that while uh, the, the B group um, has, in theory, and I agree that it's unfeasible, a right to group privacy from external, from the inference, does it also mean that uh, the members and the group also have a right vis-a-vis -vis the other members of the group? So, you know, a smoker has the right to not see details about smoking uh, disclosed because it might have a repercussion on, on that person as a smoker, so by other smokers. And just one, uh, I ask this because um, in, in my mind there might be the configuration of this kind of right within the group, yeah. within the members of the group, and, and I, I think that if we borrow some concepts from actor and actor theory, actually even though it's still unfeasible, a whole system of rights might actually de create a diffuse liability, like the one that Tobner talks about, to still create a safety mechanism in that case, and I'd love to have your opinion about that. Yeah. Thanks. So let's, let's take the smoker example. So first of all, we're not arguing against individual rights to, uh, that are actually, I think, implicit already in the purpose limitation. Uh, individual rights to avoid certain kinds of inferences. If I write my stuff on Facebook uh, and they don't, uh, I don't uh, sign a constant that talks about medical data or inferring medical data, I, I think uh, it will be quite problematic if they were to calculate the likelihood that I get depressed and maybe start selling me advertising based on that. But that's not uh, what, what's at stake. Is, is, is does the group, in this case of smokers, but not smokers today, because smokers today are, are even organized, we can say, as an A group. This will be smokers before, before uh, the scientific evidence of smoking as an important precursor of many diseases is discovered. And so basically there are two uh, reasons. The feasibility reasons is that basically if the group not even has consciousness of itself as a group, uh, how, how can they basically exercise a group right? And then the, there is the moral argument that imagine if the smokers could exercise this group right as a group. There's something odd. Maybe they, as a collective, most of them had an interest to that the knowledge that allows the inference from smoke to higher risk is not in the public. But this uh, doesn't seem a good balancing of the interest from the point of view of society. And that's partly because it's part of the of, of this of this kind of groups that they are open ended. So this will be like giving a right to the smokers at, at a certain time to make decisions uh, that will affect a lot of potential smokers, including people that would have never become smokers if they if they if they could know that smoking was bad for their health. So uh, for this, so basically these are the problems. As, as, as you can see, this can also be a problem from the individual versus the group. Because if you have a group right in, the, in, the, in, the, in a sense of the, of the, uh, the, the, that implies exercise by the group, like a vote by all the smokers in the world, there may be smokers saying, no, I want people to know about the fact that smoking causes cancer. Even if I will, if, even if I will get higher prices in insurance, uh, as a result, because uh, for my values, that's more important. And this is a problem you will have also if you have an, an A group. Aviva, please. Uh, hi, Aviva. I'm, I'm also from Tilt. Um, I have another question. It's related, but I, I think it's still different. If, if you indeed define privacy mainly as access and um, I think at the end, I was missing something, and that is, uh, if you think of decisional privacy, um, it's more about agency and, and uh, knowing enough about what's going on to make up your own mind. 
then um, the problem with um, inferred information about uh, the B group is the fact that cho choice architectures are based upon this information, which has effects on these people, but they will only have that effect as a group, but they don't know that they're part of this group. And I don't know how your um, concept addresses that problem. So the, if the question is, this problem cannot be uh, even described uh, by the concepts that have been used to set up this argument, uh, I don't think so, because um, if you can define inferential privacy, then you can define an individual right to inferential privacy. So if there is, an, there is some um, right, or at least uh, it, it can be a prima facie right that gets defeated in some cases uh, to uh, control even inferences that are made based on public data. For instance, uh, people tweet, and then there was, this was actually a concrete case in which uh, a NGO developed a tool for people who had been uh, on treatment for psychological issues to measure if they were likely to relapse into, I don't remember, maybe depression based on their tweets. And tweets are public. Still, uh, the, 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 the people resented that and they had to quit the process. So questions like these, these uh, can be exercised as a right of individuals to, 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 to control their, the, this kind of, uh, of privacy, or the group, once the group evolves into an A group. The problem is that the, 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 the fact that the B group will become an A group cannot be taken for granted. There will be a lot of groups that are defined simply by inference that won't become a big group. They won't, uh, they w you will not have no self-identification. You will have no awareness of the people in the group that they are part of a group and they are treated like that. Now, should there be a rule that all big groups become A groups? That, that also seems absurd, right? So it seems, it seems it really varies from case by case. Okay, sorry, we need to move. Oh. I'm, I'm awfully sorry because we are running out of time. Please uh, gather all your uh, questions that you have for the speakers and there will be a cocktail uh, reception afterwards. I would encourage you to, to approach him. Sorry so much. Um, me, because I am the chair, I will say that uh, maybe it will be very useful to provide um, easier definitions in your paper, at least for the legal community. That would be very good. And the others part that I wanted to say is that it is very interesting the fact that when we're having these discussions it sounds that we want to be in that group but Taylor actually says that sometimes we are part of a group without even knowing that we are part of that group right especially on the context of big data and, and AI so thank you so much for your presentation now we're going to move to the last uh, technical presentation uh, so the sorry <laughs> um so please stand up guys uh we have uh two researchers um coming from uh germany so we have on one side um kai uh, bavendig is a research assistant and phd candidate at hamburg university uh, of technology he's working at the institute of uh for software uh, systems uh, and he's working at the, an interdisciplinary project called Information Governance Technologies. Uh, and he's actually focusing on the verification of data protection principles and provisions. Um, so, the computer guy. And then we have on the other side, Florian uh, Wittner, uh, that it is a researcher and also a PhD candidate at Leibniz Institute for Media and the Hans Bredow Institute. Um, and, it, and he also for, uh, is part of, of the same project, Information Governance uh, Technologies. And his PhD is about the nature and the scope of data protection controllership under the GDPR. And his research interests are among uh, privacy, IP, IT, and internet governance. So let's see. So thank you, and let me dive right in. So the title of our paper is Modeling and Verification in GDPR's Data Protection Impact Assessment. Um, 
I'll start with the motivation and the ambition of the paper. So uh, we built on two, uh, let's say, main uh, assumptions. One is that uh, in today's increasingly connected digital services, the diffusion of personal data through various players becomes increasingly normal. So the uh, traditional way that you have one controller and one data subject and maybe a processor in the middle is becoming less and less uh, likely. And at the same time, Article 35 uh, data pr um, and its obligation to carry out a data protection impact assessment demands controllers to proactively assess the risks connected to their planned processing acts. Um, so building on that, we used a real-life case, which is the case of AccuWeather and Reveal Mobile, to make um, two examinations. Um, namely, one, um, how the extensive interpretation of joint or not joint controllership uh, after the um, uh, CGEU decisions uh, in the last years um, can be a way of mitigating the risks of diffusion of personal data in these um, connected services. And the other one, how Capverde, which is a tool, a software tool that Kai wrote, uh, can be used to support uh, DPIAs uh, in those cases. So uh, just a few words about the case for those that haven't heard of it. Um, it was about uh, three main actors. One is uh, the AccuWeather app that was on uh, Apple's iOS um, platform. And they had an SDK uh, of the self-described location-based marketing and analysis company called Reveal Mobile implemented in their source code. And uh, this SDK uh, was able to uh, access user data that were later enriched by publicly available data to uh, infer the location of those users, even when those users had specifically uh, declined to share their location data. Um, so when we look at the legal classification of who uh, should be applied a controllership here, um, if we look at the traditional definition, um, Article 4, Number 7, determining the purposes and means of the processing. So in a traditional interpretation, that means that the actor have to have uh, direct handling of the data or a and or a decisive influence on the processing, which uh, here Reveal Mobile would be a definitive yes because they were um, actively processing the data. AccuWeather would be a difficult decision because they didn't actively do anything to the data, but they had in the first place actively integrated the SDK into their app. Uh, so Apple and iOS would uh, on a first glance be a no because they just provided the uh, operating system but didn't do anything else. However, if you look at, look at the recent decisions, uh, mainly Wirtschaftsakademie Schleswig-Holstein and Jehovah's Witnesses and the AG opinions on the upcoming Fashion ID case, um, this interpretation has been broadened a lot um, and I quote, so as to ensure effective and complete protection of data subject rights. Um, so now you have a lot of cases where several parties might actually act as joint controllers. And um, I don't, won't go into too much detail here, but we think, or we thought in the paper, that um, looking at Apple and iOS here, they provided the technical infrastructure for the data access, they handled the user consent, and uh, by allowing apps on their App Store, they decided um, which purposes are okay to be on the App Store. So they kind of condoned uh, the purposes. So we um, put them as a joint controller here, which means for uh, the DPIA, uh, if we look at the definition when a DPIA is necessary, uh, it says that it is necessary when there's uh, a, it's likely to be a high risk to data subjects' rights and freedoms. And actually for location data um, that uh, are to be processed on a large scale, a lot of DPAs put them on the blacklist, which says that they every time should be uh, triggering a DPIA. So um, in addition, we looked at Recital 92, uh, which specifically addresses cases of DPIAs where you have multiple controllers. And uh, this says that it can be practical and appropriate to extend the DPIA on uh, different steps and not only look at processing acts by one controller. So that was the reason that we focused our uh, analysis on Apple or iOS but including uh, the processing acts actually carried out by, uh, in this case, Reveal Mobile. So uh, having said that, I will um, give over to Kai, who will talk you through some steps of such a DPIA by Apple and demonstrate how Cap Verde could be able to support them. 
Thank you. Right. So, um, yeah, I will, um, due to the time, uh, so we had some confusion and miscalculation, so we added some extra slides that I will not go into detail now, but if there arise questions, we can go later back to this. So this would have been some formal stuff that probably isn't interesting to most people here, so I will skip to these. Um, but again, if you have questions uh, later on, we can return. Um, so yeah, basically if we want to apply, um, we have these four steps that we want to um, take. The first is the initial risk assessment. So basically we describe um, yeah, the case. So in this, uh, in this case, it's the architecture, the software system. We have the involved uh, actors that Florian already mentioned. So um, I consider, for my uh, architecture, I consider um, the user, I consider the um, iOS, so the platform, I consider the app, and also um, Reveal Mobile as a third party involved. So, um, right, so the, um, we don't really have to assess anything because we already know the case, so we know what basically went wrong. So we have here the issue that um, there is uh, location data that uh, reaches a third party, despite the fact that um, the data subject denied this consent explicitly. And there are in this uh, structure in infrastructure that we have two, basically two channels through which uh, this location data can flow. Um, the core location API provided by Apple, which is the normal way how it should be, which is also the way the uh, app used. And also the captive network API, which is not really uh, a channel through which uh, location should flow. But um, yeah, it's basically network stuff, also including the BSSID data, which can be used if you have the uh, database for it to approximate a location. So again, this is a channel through which uh, location data can be accessed. And um, yeah, this is basically what is wrong because this channel is not, um, um, so the consent does not really cover this channel, only the first channel, the captive net, uh, the core location network. So in the second step, we would assess the uh, possible solutions and um, the first I already mentioned, so the access to the core location API is, uh, should be somehow connected to a permission, uh, which was already done, so which was the status quo. And now this new uh, solution that we propose, that we actually found uh, in the literature, some app developer proposed this solution, um, would be to also regulate the access to the captive network API. So to have uh, Apple give initial uh, individual apps some uh, permission to access the um, captive network API based on what the app does. So a uh, weather app shouldn't really have access to network uh, utility because it doesn't really provide anything like this, for instance. And uh, in the third step, we would evaluate um, the risk. So how did the risk change from the initial uh, setup to the solution? So how does the um, the altered, um, yeah, altered system perform. And then the fourth step would be um, yeah, deciding whether this is a good solution or whether it is uh, sufficient or not. So now we come to the part uh, with the software tool. So Capverde is a tool for formal privacy verification and we um, did not write it uh, for this paper, but we extended it. I already developed it and it is a somehow work in progress tool. And um, so it gives some support to someone who wants to perform such a technical DPIA analysis. Um, it provides you with the functionality of modeling uh, software architectures, which are basically a high level description of a software system based on uh, yeah, mostly data flow. And um, so we could use this in the first and the second step. So we model the original software system and then also model the system with the solution applied. And um, 
yeah, so this can be used uh, for modeling and also for properties, which are basically stating what we want um, the system or how we want the system to behave. So while the architecture says this is how it behaves, the properties describe how it should be. So if we map these together, we can see whether this holds or not. And um, Caverde also, this is the more or less the new part, uh, also uh, gives support for the actual impact assessment, um, so for the risk uh, calculations. So um, what the user still has to do manually is uh, assign impact values um, on the scale from 1 to 4. You can see here in the table um, the impact level goes from 1 to 4, meaning negligible, negligible to maximum, and the probability uh, the same. So the impact says how, yeah, what type of uh, kind of impact uh, a breach of this kind of data would have, and the probability is how likely is this event to happen. So this is, uh, I think, a typical risk uh, assessment, having probability and impact. And if you assign um, impact to data types, then Caverda can automatically uh, check whether these data types involve somehow some uh, sort of privacy breach. So if this data type can reach a third party um, despite some uh, missing consent. And then uh, you have to manually set the probability for this uh, event to happen. That's something that has to be uh, user input. And then Capverde calculates the overall risk, which is just a simple multiplication and uh, takes the maximum of all possible um, risks. So um, now how does this look like? Just um, um, so on the left, we can see the graphical user interface uh, for the uh, DPIA part of uh, Capverde. Um, yeah, so here you can set the uh, you can set the impact values, and on the bottom you can set uh, set the um, probability. And at the end, in this case, this is the original um, infrastructure. Okay. One minute. Okay, I'll have to get over this a little bit quickly. So on the right, you can see what I call software architecture. So uh, this is how Caverde views the world. And um, we have the actors, the, the user, we have the iPhone, we have the app, the real mobile, and also AccuWeather servers, which are not uh, relevant now. So the main part is that um, through these data flow errors, the uh, Wi-Fi info, which is just a placeholder for this BSS ID uh, stuff, can reach real mobile. Um, even when there is no permission for it. And so we uh, see here a risk level of 16, which is a uh, very high risk. And now on the right uh, we see the uh, solution that we already mentioned uh, briefly. That would be to, um, to have, oh, I, I did not mention this, sorry. Uh, so the uh, idea would be that iOS gives a permission to, I, I did mention, yeah, right. So um, this, you can see these arrows here. These are new. So um, the iOS basically gives permission or does not give permission to the individual apps, apps to uh, pass on network data. So in this case now, um, the architecture does check whether this uh, permission is granted or not. And we can see that Capverde calculates uh, risk of one, which is uh, low risk. So yeah, the risk assessment, this is what uh, Caberda does for you. The rest has to be decided. And the implication of this also have to be decided individually. It's now a brief conclusion by Florian again. Uh, so yeah, to sum up what we uh, just showed you, um, what can this tool do uh, at this point? It's not able to automatically check and verify everything, but it needs uh, input by the controller. But we think that this is already something that could help the controller by modeling its system and uh, better seeing um, what data flows inside the system and also outside the system are possible and might be problematic. And yeah, the second um, contribution we think that the paper makes to the legal debate is uh, the broad focus on, on platforms and their potential classifications as controllers which can show how they might be better equipped to foresee and mitigate those risks. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank, Thank you. you very much. So
We have three minutes for questions. If anyone have about this last presentation, yes, please, Lorenzo. learning moment for data controllers. So, uh, and I've been uh, working previously with the idea of uh, automating or semi-automating uh, DPIA processes and one of the main, uh, um, let's say, pushbacks that I encountered is that uh, uh, automation in a way risks uh, taking away this learning process uh, from the data controller. Did you think about it? Do you think it's a, a legitimate concern? Because I'm kind of ambivalent about it. Um, yes, so um, we also think this is a crucial part. Um, actually, that is also why this is more or less a semi-automatic approach, because the modeling itself is really um, the point where someone has to start thinking about data flow and what uh, channels and what ways there are. So basically, um, at least with the approach, approach we proposed, uh, this is really heavily the case where we really have to think about what goes on and only the automation happens after we have explicitly modeled how we view the world. So I think, um, yeah, maybe if someone advances the automation, this uh, progress could be lost and that would probably not be uh, the best idea. Yeah. Okay, so um, I think that what we understood from the panel today is that as a group, we will have to conduct a data protection impact assessment before we die. <laughs> If that is not what we understood, please uh, go back to the authors and ask for more questions, okay? So thank you so much for coming to the panel.